switch gears a little bit um, from the adaptive immune system to the um, innate immune system uh, in, uh, in COVID and in speci specifically in severe COVID-19. So <clears throat> when we, um, we first, um, when we saw the first patients uh, with COVID-19 in, in early 2020, we didn't know that uh, exactly what to expect. And what be became apparent uh, was that, the, um, that, that we have very steep viral replication prior to the onset of symptoms or around and, and around the onset of symptoms, um, we, we basically reach peak viral replication in the upper airways um, and, and uh, symptoms in the first week or so um, of, of disease, uh, somewhat unspecific flu-like illness uh, with fever, headaches, um, <clears throat> muscle ache, and so on. And uh, in, in a majority of patients with declining viral loads and uh, seroconversion actually, uh, we'd also have uh, receding symptoms, but in a fraction of patients, and, and this fraction varies depending on age and other risk factors, as well as the, um, the uh, viral variant um, that, is, uh, that is causing the infection, uh, we'd have a fraction of people um, who experience uh, severe deterioration, um, uh, which leads to hospitalization, uh, viral pneumonia uh, with hypoxia, and uh, some of which then went on to develop ARDS and require ICU admission, uh, mechanical ventilation, or even um, organ replacement therapy, such as ECMO treatment. And uh, the, the question, obviously, that um, I think uh, many people around the world have been uh, concerned with is uh, what actually drives this second phase when viral loads are already declining, um, seroconversion has basically taken place and we should in, in, in theory be capable of um, defending it against this virus. Why do some uh, people deteriorate and develop severe ARDS, uh, which has a very high mortality of about uh, 50%. Um, so what is um, ARDS? Um, it's, uh, it's a severe uh, injury, a severe acute injury of the lung. Um, caused by injury, um, in this case, viral infection, which leads to a breakdown of the alveolar barrier. And uh, obviously we need a very thin and very delicate barrier between the capillary bloodstream and the airspace here in order to allow for um, oxygenation of the blood and gas exchange. And so in the case of ARDS, we have uh, damage to the, to the capillary system. We have damage to the alveolar barrier. Uh, we have extravasation of fluids uh, into the alveolus. Uh, and this is what we see on, on x-rays and on, on CT scans as these hazy um, uh, infiltrates or ground glass opacities, uh, this infiltration of immune cells as well as edema fluid, which is now um, basically preventing proper gas exchange. And uh, we also see um, microthrombotic uh, complications in, in severe COVID. And, and, but so far, we don't know why some people are taking this route and what is basically driving this high mortality in COVID ARDS. So a study that I, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about this, um, <clears throat> just thought it was a, a nice link to the uh, preceding uh, studies on T cells, a uh, study we recently published um, that looked into the role of T cells, uh, but innate functions of T cells. And, and in fact, in, in patients with severe COVID, the most severe forms of COVID um, that, that deceased from uh, from COVID ARDS. And what we found was that on, on these, in these uh, patients, we see uh, that a strong activation of complement, uh, which I, I think is uh, many groups have observed. And some of these complement components can induce a very uh, peculiar phenotype in uh, cytotoxic CD8 T cells with high expression of CD16, which is the receptor uh, for antibodies for, for the FC fragment. So it's the FC receptor which is normally not expressed on T cells. And, and these, um, these uh, T cells then can bind circulating immune complexes uh, of which there are quite a bit in, in patients with severe COVID. And, and through this activation, uh, we get, uh, get excessive uh, cytotoxic T cell responses and damage of the, um, of the capillary system in the lung and vascular damage. This is uh, one mechanism by which we think some of this injury is uh, basically mediated that leads to the early uh, ed uh, edema and the, um, 
uh, early phase of, of uh, COVID ARDS. Another question is when, when viral loads are already declining, how come that uh, some of the patients uh, de deteriorate? And uh, this is a, a nice review that was put forward very early on uh, from my uh, former colleagues at Mount Sinai. And they uh, suggested that um, myeloid cells, specifically inflammatory macrophages and monocytes might be playing a role in this process. And some of these mediators here, such as IL-6, you know, uh, currently um, uh, targets for a therapeutic treatment in, in the most severe forms of, of COVID ARDS. We can block um, IL-6 uh, receptors or IL-6, for example. But um, we wanted to zoom in a little bit more on these myeloid cell responses. And to this end, uh, we performed a, a dual center study by which we really analyzed with quite a high resolution uh, myeloid cell responses in patients with either mild or moderate forms of COVID compared those to severe forms of COVID. We did that in two, two independent cohorts running um, uh, and performing uh, single cell multiomics experiments, uh, both for proteomic analysis and transcriptomic analysis. And we, um, we then uh, validated and cross-validated our findings in those two uh, study cohorts and related our findings to disease severity and, uh, and time point within the disease course. So this is just aggregated data of our cohort in Berlin, uh, looking into the single cell uh, space uh, in, in blood of patients with mild and severe COVID. And you can just see here that we can obviously identify all types of cell populations. What I, what I wanted to show you is um, that if we plot these cells according to disease severity, so the, the group of patients that experienced only mild uh, disease and cleared the, the, the infection uh, without complication, compare those to those patients that actually um, experienced uh, a severe disease and deteriorated and had to be intubated, we can see that there are severe uh, uh, changes specifically within the myeloid, myeloid cell compartment, specifically within the monocyte space, as well as in the granulocytic uh, cell uh, space. <clears throat> I don't have time to go into all the details, but one takeaway is that if you look into patients that have severe COVID, you can see really quite low expression of markers that we normally find in patients with, for instance, other flu-like illnesses, mild infections or mild COVID, um, high levels of MHC molecules and other co-stimulatory molecules and activation markers, um, so while other markers uh, and integrins are upregulated. And if we um, zoom in on the monocyte space, we can actually find a quite this nice separation between monocytes in green here that we find in patients with um, with mild forms of COVID and in those purple populations that we find in predominantly in patients um, with a severe COVID and they're uh, marked by different uh, uh, molecules. And interestingly enough, we find a lot of um, inhibitory molecules um, and uh, that uh, in the somehow dysregulated gene expression in those patients with severe COVID. And this is summarized here. So in, um, this was um, published already um, almost uh, one and a half year ago. And so in patients with, um, with mild COVID, or for that sake, also with other mild viral infections, we do prop see proper activation of peripheral monocytes, as we would expect with co-stimulatory molecules and activation markers. But in those uh, patients with severe COVID, we see a severe dysfun uh, dysfunctional a monocyte activation with low levels of MHC molecules. Instead, they express high levels of this molecule here, CD163, which is a scavenger receptor. And they also express very high levels of alarmants, which I think have been identified now in the whole number of studies as a marker of severe disease. We also find uh, a se um, a severe uh, um, changes in the myeloid cell compartment in the granulocytic lineage. This is, uh, we interpret this as a sign of emergency myelopoiesis since we um, see um, a release of immature and rather inhibitory uh, granulocytes into the bloodstream. However, and uh, what we actually wanted to see is obviously um, what is happening in, at the site of infection. And early on, we looked into uh, mucosal sites um, um, using um, uh, swab samples of the upper end as well as the lower respiratory tract. And um, I'm just gonna go quickly over this because uh, what we found here was that in patients that, that had uh, critical disease or moderate disease, um, 
had strong accumulation of a certain monocyte and macrophage uh, subsets. And uh, when we performed a, a in silico cell uh, interaction analysis, we found that those macrophages appeared to engage in lots of interactions um, with resident cells, non-immune cells, as well as other immune cells. And that's what uh, caught our attention. We wanted to further investigate the role uh, of these macrophages and actually in the lung. Um, just coming back to this schematic here, this is the early phase where we see injury caused by viral infection and damage to um, vascular um, uh, endothelium as well as the epithelium. At later stages in ARDS, it's known that we get a sort of uh, repair response that um, goes along with the proliferation and expansion of interstitial cells, uh, such as fibroblasts, and myofibroblasts, and deposition of fibers. And uh, however, these, if, if, and these are, do only occur in a, in a small subset of ARDS patients normally. And um, this specifically this fibrotic phase is associated with a prolonged need for mechanical ventilation and the poor outcome. And so um, this is just to sort of, uh, we wanted to find out what is happening across basically um, uh, longitudinally to in, in patients with uh, severe COVID ARDS um, and what actually drives this very high mortality and what's the role of macrophages in this. Um, to this extent, uh, again, we performed a, a study in patients both in Berlin and in another university center in Germany, where we collected uh, um, different types of samples, both um, from the respiratory tract, this is uh, bronchial lavage fluids, as well as samples from patients that unfortunately deceased due to COVID ARDS, autopsy samples, and we also performed a lot of clinical analysis and imaging studies on patients that were on the ECMO treatment because of severe COVID-19. And uh, one of the first features that we noticed was that we, um, similar to um, what other groups had described and what we had found in the mucosal samples in the upper and lower airways, was that in patients with uh, COVID ARDS, we see a very pronounced accumulation of macrophages, CD68 positive macrophages in the tissue. And you can also see how the tissue architecture is completely destroyed. You can't make um, uh, out the normal alveolar uh, uh, architecture here anymore. We see severe and diffuse alveolar damage. Those macrophages that accumulate, they also tend to take up a lot of SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA, which is, I think, has to be expected. Macrophages are phagocytic cells, probably taking up dead cells, taking up free variants. Um, but what we know so far is that macrophages are not actually productively infected. Um, when we look closely, more closely here again, we can um, stain in, in green for macrophages, that most of those macrophages in the lung co-express this receptor CD163, which we had identified also to be highly expressed on monocytes and circulating blood of patients with severe COVID. And this is quantified here. You can see almost um, uh, all of the patients that uh, this is a cohort of patients uh, that died from COVID have uh, very high numbers of macrophages, which co-express uh, CD163. To get a more detailed view of the macrophage space and the myeloid cells in the lung parenchyma and in the, in the, in the lower airways in, in uh, patients with severe COVID, we performed a single cell RNA sequencing. And this is zooming in uh, only on the macrophage uh, space here of the, of the cellularity that we recovered from patients uh, over uh, in with uh, severe COVID. And what, uh, what I'm not showing you again, we see an accumulation of, of myeloid cells, specifically uh, macrophages. When we look into those macrophages, we can see uh, that most of these macrophages here are monocyte derived. So we have, uh, we can uh, define those subpopulations, uh, monocytes that then quickly differentiate into a cell type, which we call a CD163 ligomyin positive uh, monocyte derived macrophages. So this, these red guys here, so to say. And later on in the disease, we do get repopulation of the alveolar macrophage space. So alveolar macrophages being resident uh, lung macrophages that are um, depleted in the early stages of COVID and then repopulated later on. And when we look into gene expression of those um, uh, monocyte derived macrophages that dominate the acute stages of COVID, um, we see a very specific gene transcriptional uh, gene uh, transcription signature here. And many of those genes are related to tissue repair responses, damage repair responses, um, as well as uh, the TGF beta related genes and, and chemokines.
and um, this 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 transcriptional signature reminded us very much of, of other signatures that that we had seen in the literature in in another a disease which is totally unrelated to COVID, and this disease is called uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So this is a chronic uh, 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 disease that uh, leads to scarring, to irreversible scarring of the lung. It's chronically progressive. There is no uh, uh, real causative treatment, and it's a, it has a very poor outcome, similar to cancer. It's a very uh, it's a very uh, um, severe disease uh, that leads to progressive scarring of the lung. And when we uh, looked into um, uh, single cell studies that have been recently performed on macrophages isolated from patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and then we extracted those those gene signatures and mapped those onto the macrophages that we'd recovered in macrophage uh, transcriptomes that we did recovered in COVID patients, we can see how those IPF specific signatures very strongly enrich exactly in this uh, population of CD163 positive macrophages. And, and, and um, CD163 also is a marker that is often used in also in IPF and other fibrotic conditions. And it's associated um, with a poor outcome in some of these uh, chronic fibrotic diseases. And we um, also did a more, um, uh, performed a more um, uh, un, unbiased approach and, and asked uh, Fabian Theis and his team from Munich for help. And they helped us to integrate a lot of different data sets, both our own uh, COVID data set, another COVID data set, and different uh, data sets from uh, um, uh, the immune cells in, in uh, chronic lung conditions such as COPD and IPF. And uh, what we did here was uh, we measured the, the, the distance, if you wish, um, between uh, macrophages and COVID and, uh, and different types of lung conditions. And what we found was that there is the highest similarity between CD163 macrophages and macrophages that were found in IPF versus the alveolar macrophages are more closely related to control cells. Now, um, so we see um, um, uh, macrophages accumulate in, in chronic, uh, in, in, in acute COVID ARDS that look very much similar to macrophages that normally accumulate in a chronic non-infectious a chronically progressive uh, fibrotic condition. And um, the reason why macrophages have been focused on recently is that it becomes uh, uh, increasingly clear that macrophages and, and fibroblasts and myofibroblasts are closely interlinked and, and sort of uh, modulate the fibrotic niche and can drive tissue uh, um, <clears throat> Um, tissue fibrosis. And um, so, so we wanted to take a closer look on the relationship between macrophages and fibroblasts in, in COVID. And again, we turn to our autopsy samples. And what you can see here um, is that in, in um, comparison to, to patients that died from other causes other than COVID, we can see a massive expansion of those green cells. Those are myofibroblasts in the lungs of patients with COVID ARDS. Um, they are uh, interspersed with um, these red macrophages. And when we perform single nuclei sequencing, so extracted the nuclei here and, and uh, performed RNA sequencing, we can see that we get very strong transcriptional activation of those fibroblasts that show a high upregulation of, of lots of collagen genes. And uh, in silico predictions of cell-cell interactions using this tool called CellChat also revealed uh, quite strong interactions, again, between those CD163 positive macrophages and fibroblasts along with my myofibroblasts. So we have quite good evidence that A, we have a, a cell type macrophage that is transcriptionally very similar to IPF associated macrophages and it um, seems to uh, engage in strong interactions with, with fibroblasts, which in turn are activated and produce um, a lot of uh, matrix. Now, do those patients actually clinically also develop fibrosis? And I think this is um, absolutely, absolutely an, an, uh, an overlooked phenomenon. When we do, uh, we can do this uh, measuring, uh, measuring uh, uh, lung capacity on the ventilator, and we see the lung capacity is severely reduced on patients on ECMO, indicating a restrictive ventilatory disorder. Um, but we also, this is a control CT scan and um, of a healthy lung. And then we have this patient that came in with COVID ARDS. You can see these patchy infiltrates. This is this acute alveolar damage with extravasation of fluids. 
And then over time, these, um, this damage increases and we see consolidations in the lung with massive infiltration of immune cells. But uh, later on, we see very, very extensive scarring of the lung and this patient unfortunately could not survive this. When we quantify this on the, um, uh, in our autopsy cohort, uh, we can uh, uh, see here even stain for collagen. You can immediately see that you have massive accumulation of, of collagen and other extracellular matrix components. And this was scored by two independent pathologists. And you can see that all of the patients that in this uh, autopsy cohort that died from COVID-19 ARDS had massive fibro fi fibrosis and other reports have have actually confirmed this. Um, so, so I think in patients with the most severe forms of, of COVID ARDS, um, fibrosis is, is a very critical factor that, um, that also might be causative for some of the very high mortality rates that we see. So we, to get a better understanding of the type of fibrosis that is happening, we teamed up with another group that is very well versed in studying ultrastructural changes of uh, fibrosis in the lung. This is the team of, uh, of Matthias Ox. And without going into detail, we can see a lot of features that, are, that they normally see in patients with IPF. So this is what they call alveolar denuding. So loss of, of epithelial cells and then the basal membrane is somewhat glued together and it's accompanied by a massive deposition here of extracellular fibers. And the macrophages, interestingly, also have a very uh, a strange appearance here where this is a control cell. And here we have uh, these macrophages in COVID, which have a distinctively foamy appearance, uh, which might fit to the uh, upregulation of, uh, of genes involved in lipid metabolism. So the final piece of data I wanna show is that we um, wanted to understand whether the virus itself could have something to do with this profibrotic phenotype in, in macrophages. And we uh, took monocytes from healthy volunteers and stimulated those in vitro with different types of stimuli. So toll-like receptor stimuli or, um, that should mimic <clears throat> RNA viruses. Two minutes. SARS-CoV-2. And um, um, cutting a long story short, we can see that only in cells that have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, we again see a massive enrichment of this profibrotic uh, transcriptional signature, which was not observed in cells stimulated otherwise. And, and similar, a similar thing is true when we look at this at the, at the proteomic level. Um, again, we see stimulation with SARS-CoV-2 uh, leads to um, <coughs> strong upregulation of these profibrotic signatures here in blue which does not occur in cells that have been stimulated, for example, with the influenza A virus. So indicating that somehow the, the virus itself is capable of inducing at least this transcriptional signature that is, um, that is similar to one that we can find in fibrosis patients. So to sum this all up, we have an early uh, injury that is caused by viral infection and monocytes and macrophages come in and they phagocytose dead cells and, and free variants. This leads to the... Uh, um, early phases of ARDS, but later on somehow macrophages are polarized into this uh, phenotype that is somehow a, a, a un unchecked, uncontrolled, leads to an unchecked, uncontrolled profibrotic tissue repair response, which leads to exacerbated fibroproliferative ARDS, and is probably causative for the very high rates of mortality that we see. Um, so last uh, thing. Um, those COVID patients that we can actually wean off the ventilator and wean off the ECMO again, they have a really remarkable capacity to clear some of the even extensive fibros fibrotic lesions that we observe during their uh, ICU stay. And this is something that you would never see in a patient with um, IPF or other chronic fibrotic lung conditions. And what we want to study right now is what is driving fibrotic resolution? How can we reprogram those fibrotic responses? And I think this is something that can be learned uh, when we study fibrosis resolution. Again, I have to, um, like, uh, like all the others here, I have to thank a big, big team specifically at Charité Berlin, which uh, we also built a, a massive biobank to do all these studies. And uh, I, it's a too long list to name all of these, but Daniel, he led the study on the fibrotic um, uh, macrophages and Emmanuel Saliba in Würzburg helped a lot with all the RNA analysis. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Sander, um, and uh, I think Harry Green is now going to take over as I had an unforeseen prior commitment, uh, so he's going to handle the Q&A question, <laughs> the next speaker. Thank you, Eric. No worries. Uh, thank you, Leif. Uh, that, was, that was a great talk, and I'm glad you were able to end on what looks like some good news. Um, 
at least for these severely uh, affected patients. Um, and again, I remind attendees, please raise your hand. Panelists, please raise your hands if you have questions. And I'd like to start off with one that I think is, I don't know if it's simple or not. Um, so for the data that you showed for the monocytes, I noticed that you had um, information on patients that were affected early stages and late stages, both for the mild and the severe um, diseases. And I'm just wondering if you have <coughs> similar types of data for your other um, uh, studies and whether in thinking about those types of temporal analyses, is there some signature that you can find that would indicate when a patient might make a transition from what is a mild presentation to something that's much more severe? Well, thank you very much. That's obviously a very relevant question. Uh, so we do have these longitudinal samples also for the, um, those, for example, for those BAL samples, but we're doing this now in a much more systematic fashion that we're actually trying to find exactly the time point when fibrosis resolution occurs. So this is for this question. Very early on, obviously, to get to, um, to get uh, BAL samples from patients that are still in their uh, mild stages of disease is, is uh, uh, ethically very difficult to, to do in Germany. So we, we have done this for blood samples. We have done similar analysis doing um, plasma proteomics analysis. And, and there, and indeed, we can identify early on signatures that very accurately predict um, adverse outcome. So that do predict this patient is probably gonna deteriorate and, and most likely and we can actually predict survival uh, quite well. <clears throat> we haven't been able to do so in the sing on the single cell data set just simply because this is a small, too small cohort. So the, the other data set that I talked about is a plasma proteomic approach uh, that is um, ultra high throughput where we can actually measure thousands of samples and we can align that with clinical data and actually make pretty good uh, predictions using machine learning. But uh, we haven't been able to do anything like that uh, on this smaller single cell RNA data set. Um, so far, so we can just, what, we, what we're I think able to do is to classify, we can find disease classifiers, but really predictive markers that tell us this patient is probably gonna deteriorate, we haven't been able to, to actually see. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, do we have any additional questions for Leaf? Um, I don't see any. Um, so I may ask one more then. Um, so when you're describing an early severe case, um, what is the what, uh, what does the presentation look like compared to an early mild case? Are they basically the same type of symptoms? And it's just the progression that, that, that's different in two cases? Yes, oftentimes it's really hard to, hard to tell. And especially in the first few waves, um, progression can occur really quickly. And so obviously there are some risk factors where we know uh, progression to severe disease is more likely. Or if we see um, uh, infiltration in the, in, in the CT scan, we would you know, already know that probably this 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 might uh, be uh, uh, that might definitely uh, deteriorate. Other than that, um, in the early stages, it's difficult to find clinical markers that would uh, would tell you. Uh, other than you know, there are some laboratory markers that that have been used that are that are decent, uh, but uh, just purely clinical markers from from the type of clinical presentation that I don't think there is um, anything that would. Um, that would predict this outcome unless the patient already comes in with hypoxemia and, and uh, elevated breathing uh, frequency, and which would already indicate, you know, that that this is um, going south, if you wish. Uh, we have a question from Rodney Rothstein. Uh, Rodney, you should be able to unmute and talk. Yes, thank you. Thanks for that great talk. I was, I was, I'm curious about whether your last point about um, markers made me think about whether the, um, you have the possibility of doing metabolomics on your samples. And, um, and I'm interested in this and I would be happy to talk to you about it offline, but I just was curious as to whether you're doing any metabolomics on any of these cells. So uh, we haven't 
We haven't done that, and that would indeed be interesting uh, because obviously we do see from the transcriptional profile that those cells most likely have a severely altered metabolism. Um, there have been some studies, and we've also done our own studies, you know, just doing um, metabolomics on plasma samples. And I think, you know, there are multiple studies out there. Uh, I haven't really seen very conclusive evidence out of these um, studies, but we haven't looked at cell metabolism uh, in, in our assays, neither in the um, ex vivo setting or in the um, uh, uh, in vivo setting where we where we analyze the cells directly. So happy to talk about it. Okay, good. I'll get I'll get in touch with you. Thank you so much. Yes, great. Okay.